the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, a gazette notification related to the revision of water tariffs has been issued by the Ministry of Water Supply and Estate Infrastructure Development with the implementation starting this month. The Cabinet of Ministers approves an extension of the project implementation period for Port City Colombo, which is governed by the Strategic Development Project Act. The stock market concludes a challenging week dominated by negative sentiment. Despite experiencing some mixed feelings on certain days, the market becomes unable to shift into a positive trend. And Eurozone business activity surges unexpectedly during the month, with gains which may be temporary due to Olympic-driven boosts in French services. From Studio 24, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The Gazette notification related to the revision of water tariffs has been issued by the Ministry of Water Supply and Estate Infrastructure Development. Accordingly, the new water tariffs are implemented effective from the 21st of August. The categories affected by this new water tariff revision are domestic consumers, government schools, government-aided schools, government-approved religious institutions and government hospitals, excluding some of the beneficiaries and estate households. Based on the price formula, the National Water Supply and Drainage Board has approved a reduction in water tariffs by 7% for domestic consumers, 4.5% for government hospitals and 6.3% for temples and religious places. Overall, a 5.94% reduction in water tariffs has been approved by the Cabinet. For domestic consumers, the tariff units from 0 to 5 has been reduced from 60 rupees to 50 rupees, which is a decrease of 10 rupees per unit. For units between 76 to 100, the tariff has been reduced from 270 rupees to 250 rupees, recording a 20 rupees per unit decrease. For government and government aided schools, as well as government approved religious institutions and government hospitals, the tariff for all units has been reduced from 60 rupees to 55 rupees, which is a decrease of 5 rupees per unit. Additionally, for government hospitals where the tariff for unit was 100 rupees, it has been reduced to 95 rupees, which is a decrease of 5 rupees per unit. However, under this new water tariff revision, there have been no changes to the monthly service charges. A government statement said that Sri Lanka's cabinet has approved awarding the contract to purchase three shipments of Merban type of crude oil from the 15th of November this year to the 14th of April next year to Vital Asia PTE Limited. The 2,100,000 barrels will be obtained on the basis of payment in 30 days through a letter of credit issued by the Bank of Ceylon. Bids were called by the state-owned Ceylon Petroleum Corporation from registered suppliers for a long-term contract and five bids were received. The bid submitted via Vital Asia Private Limited in Singapore was recommended as the responsive bid by the Cabinet-appointed Special Standing Procurement Committee. Merban is a light crude that can be processed by a refinery owned by the CPC. The Cabinet of Ministers has approved an extension of the project implementation period for Port City Colombo Limited, which is a major development initiative governed by the Strategic Development Project Act No. 14 of 2008. Originally set to conclude on the 7th of September this year, the project deadline has now been extended to the 30th of June in 2027. This extension was approved by the Cabinet during a meeting held on the 5th of August this year and was formally enacted through an order of publish in the Extraordinary Gazette No. 2396 over 60 on the 9th of August 2024. The order grants the project the relevant exemptions under the Strategic Development Act, which is designed to promote and facilitate significant strategic investments in Sri Lanka. This legislative framework is aimed at boosting the country's attractiveness for large-scale investments. The proposal to extend the project's timeline was presented by President Ranil Vikramasinghe, who also holds the position of Investment Promotion Minister. His presentation highlighted the importance of the extension for ensuring the successful completion of Port City Project, which is a key element in Sri Lanka's strategic development plans. <laughs> The Cabinet of Ministers has also approved the awarding of contracts for the operation of six tourist service counters at the Bandaranaika International Airport in Katunaika for three years. Speaking at the weekly post-Cabinet meeting media briefing, Cabinet spokesperson and Minister Bandalagunawardhana said the move follows a competitive bidding process initiated by Airport and Aviation Services Limited. The selected companies include Airport Tourist Drivers Association, Aibo on Tours and Travels Limited, Avavia Tours Limited, Lanka Travel Agent Association, Kaysen's Travels Limited, and JNW Lanka Tours. 
A total of 12 bids were received in response to the call for tenders to operate the service counters located in the vacant lobby area in the front of the arrivals terminal of the Bandaranaik International Airport. After a thorough evaluation by the Technical Appraisal Committee and the Standing Procurement Committee, which were appointed by the Cabinet, the bidders who submitted the highest, most responsive proposals were selected for the utilisation of the respective areas for a period of three years. Gunavardhana said the new tourist service counters are expected to offer a range of services to incoming travellers, contributing to an improved visit experience and boosting tourism industry and economy. Let's take a short break now. Updates from the stock market right after this. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The week concluded on a negative note at the Colombo Stock Exchange, with today's market session also experiencing losses. Both indices ended in the red, capping off a week marked by a downward trend. For further insights, let's turn to Vinodini Rajapupati from First Capital Holdings. Thank you. The Colombo Stock Exchange continued its downward trend today, marking the fifth straight session of losses. The market faced a volatile swing driven by political uncertainty, subdued investor sentiment and a surge in bargain buying. The ASPI closed the day at 11,362, marking a 96-point drop from the previous day, whilst the S&P SL20 index slipped by 34 points to close at 3,254. The decline was largely driven by losses in the banking sector, with key players such as HNB, Sampath and Commercial Bank weighing down the index. However, increased participation from high net worth individuals pushed the turnover to 1.2 billion rupees, marking a 58% increase from the monthly average. Meanwhile, off-board transactions accounted for 59% of the total turnover, with notable activities seen in Malvatta Valley Plantations and Ambient Holdings. The food, beverage and tobacco sector dominated the turnover, contributing 40%, whilst the banking and capital goods sector collectively contributed 32% to the total turnover. The top gainers for the day were Alpha Fire Services, Colombo City Holdings, Sarvodaya Development Finance, PMF Finance and Overseas Realty. Meanwhile, the top losers for the day were Blue Diamonds Jewelry, Voting and Non-Voting, SMB Finance Non-Voting, Nations Trust Bank Non-Voting and Abans Finance. Additionally, foreign investors maintained their position as net buyers with a net inflow of 41 million rupees for the day. Thank you. The stock market has had a challenging week dominated by a negative sentiment. Despite experiencing some mixed feelings on certain days, the market was unable to shift into a positive trend. To provide a summary of this relatively brief week's performance, we now turn to Netmi Fernando from First Capital Holdings. Thank you. The market commenced at the short week on a lackluster sentiment as both indices recorded in the red zone whilst ASPI recorded at 11,495. Selected banking sector shares and blue chip companies dragged the index down amidst very low high net worth investor participation. Further towards the week, the market experienced a volatile state. However, banking sector shares picked up revitalized buying interest with both retail and high net worth investor uh, participating. Towards the latter part of the week, the market experienced sideways movement whilst retail participation remained stagnant. ASPI was recorded at 11,362, closing the week on the red zone amidst a high number of off-board transactions recorded influenced by bargain buying. On the flip side, ASPI gained 639 points during the week, whilst a turnover was recorded at LKR 1.2 billion, 58% higher than the monthly average of LKR 771.7 million towards the end of the week. Closing with mixed contribution by retailers and high net worth individuals. 
The investors displayed a cautious stance throughout the week, influenced by the surrounding uncertainty regarding the upcoming government transition along with the finalization on debt sustainability program in the country. Gold prices inched up today but were set for a weekly decline as the US dollar and Treasury yields rebounded ahead of Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell's speech that could offer fresh insights on the central bank's interest rate cut plans. Spot gold rose 0.3% to $2,491.35 per ounce and US gold futures gained 0.4% to $2,526.80. After hitting an all-time high of $2,000, $2,531.60 on Tuesday, bullion has fallen nearly 1% this week, hurt by a bounce in dollar index and benchmark U.S. 10-year yields. Fed policymakers are likely to start rate cuts next month as inflation drops and the labor market slows, though one member warned against acting too quickly. Oil prices stabilized today after rebounding in the previous session due to some bargain hunting, but were still poised for substantial weekly losses amid persistent concerns over weakening demand. Brent oil futures expiring in October edged up 0.1% to $77.26 per barrel, while West Texas intermediate crude futures rose 0.1% to $72.34 per barrel. Ongoing negotiations over a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas also saw traders assign a smaller risk premium to crude, as U.S. officials indicated that an agreement was close. Oil markets were rattled by data showing a sharp downward revision in U.S. payrolls, which heightened concerns over a potential economic downturn. The Sri Lankan rupee has depreciated further against the U.S. dollar at commercial banks in Sri Lanka today compared to yesterday. According to the statement from the People's Bank, the buying rate of the U.S. dollar has increased from 294 rupees and 93 cents to 295 rupees and 67 cents. And the selling rate has increased from 305 rupees and 51 cents to 306 rupees and 27 cents. Let's now observe the rupees exchange rates for today. A short break now, this is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Aether Energy, an electric vehicle manufacturer based in India, said that it plans to expand into Sri Lanka in the coming quarter, days after it secured funding from NIIF at a unicorn valuation. The expansion will be the company's second international launch after it entered Nepal last year. Aether will set up an experience centre through a partnership with Evolution Auto Private Limited, a joint venture between Sensei Capital Partners, Atman Group and Sri Lanka-based Sinolanka Private Limited. Evolution Auto will serve as the company's national distributor and will manage Aether Energy's sales and service operations in Sri Lanka. Additionally, Aether will also focus on establishing a network of fast charging infrastructure across the country to facilitate electric vehicle adoption. Mr. R. Singh, the chief business officer of Aether Energy, said they are thrilled to enter the Sri Lankan market and Sri Lanka has been a part of their global expansion plans after Nepal, where they established their presence last year. Aether Energy competes with the newly listed Ola Electric and reportedly plans to list on the Indian stock exchanges next year. United Petroleum of Australia was launched in Sri Lanka yesterday and the company will commence retail fuel operations next month with 150 dealer-owned and operated fuel stations. United Petroleum has become the fourth retail operator to enter Sri Lankan petroleum market, joining the ranks of LIOC, Sinopec and RM Park Shell. This marks a significant expansion in the country's fuel retail sector. 
Earlier this year, United Petroleum signed a formal agreement with the Ministry of Power and Energy, paving the way for the company to launch its petroleum retail operations on the island. This development is a part of Sri Lanka's broader strategy to diversify its fuel supply sources and reduce the financial pressure on the state-owned Ceylon Petroleum Corporation. Last year, the Sri Lankan government awarded retail fuel license to three international firms, namely China Sinopec, United Petroleum from Australia and the US-based RM Parks. To regulate the operations for these new entrants, the government imposed specific conditions. This includes the requirement for the fuel retailers to use foreign currency sources from their parent companies for their import activities. Additionally, there is a restriction on the repatriation of the foreign currency from Sri Lanka, ensuring that the financial flow remains controlled with the country's borders. In response to the challenges of solid waste management, Deutsche Gelschaft für International Zusammenarbeit, along with three of Sri Lanka's largest fast-moving consumer goods companies, Coca-Cola Sri Lanka Beverages Limited and the Coca-Cola Foundation, Nestle and Unilever, have launched a sustainable plastic waste management project. This public-private partnership named Waste to Value aims to tackle plastic pollution by strengthening infrastructure for the collection, segregation, recycling and upcycling of plastic waste. Additionally, the project seeks to drive a behavioural shift towards a circular economy by creating awareness about the value of responsibly disposed waste for both livelihoods and the environment. This initiative is financed by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development as part of its DEVELOP program, together with its consortium partners. Ceylon Bank continues its commitment to support the growth of small and medium enterprises by expanding its range of affordable and flexible financing solutions. The bank now offers SMEs, solar and working capital loans, providing critical funding options for businesses in urgent need of financial support. Ceylon Bank Solar Loans provide SMEs with an affordable and flexible financing option that facilitates the adoption of renewable energy as business investments. With Ceylon Eco Solar Loan, SMEs can power their businesses with renewable energy in a move that promotes sustainability and minimizes the impact of their carbon footprint. While contributing to the nation's sustainable energy goals, this initiative also aims to elevate the financial viability and competitiveness of SMEs. Ideal for commercial entities exploring options to reduce energy costs and their carbon footprint, Ceylon Bank's Eco Solar Loans also allow both industrial and agricultural sectors to boost operational efficiency. Diva Dathada Diryak Entrepreneurial Skills Development Program, which is a transformative collaboration between Diva, the flagship laundry care brand of Hamas Consumer Brands, and Women in Management, extended its initiative to the central province recently. In celebration of the World Entrepreneurs Day falling on the 21st of August, a one-day seminar of Diva Dathada Diryak program was conducted by Dr. Sulochana Sigera, chairman of the WIM, at Martha Division Secretariat with the participation of over 100 women entrepreneurs in the central province. Followed by a seminar, the two-day workshop was conducted to provide practical experience on entrepreneurial skills to further enhance the experience of women entrepreneurs. This is a part of the ongoing highly successful series of Diva Dathar Diryak program aimed at equipping women with skills, knowledge and confidence to thrive in an extremely challenging entrepreneurial world. Since its inception in 2022, Diva Dathara Diryak program has empowered a shift in mindset amongst women, helping them to evolve from mere producers to very successful entrepreneurs. The program covered a multitude of essential areas such as business, registration, financial management, pricing strategy, consumer care, digital marketplaces, marketing, branding and packaging. Let's take a short commercial break now. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Most Asian stocks fell today as markets gauged hawkish comments from the Bank of Japan and mixed Japanese inflation data, with focus turning squarely to the address by the Federal Reserve Chairman. Regional markets took a weak lead in from the Wall Street as a rebound in Treasury yields and a sharp sell-down in technology shares sparked steep overnight losses. Japan's Nikkei 225 and Topics indexes fell about 0.2% each, with both indexes set for a middling end to 
into the week as a rebound from early August losses stalled. Broader Asian markets mostly edged lower and were set for a middling week performance as a rebound from early August losses stalled. Technology heavy indexes saw relatively bigger losses. All three major U.S. stock indexes lost ground weighed by technology shares as global central bank officials convened at the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium. U.S. stocks fell across the board Thursday as all of the mega-cap technology stocks in the Magnificent Seven lost ground. The Dow slid four-tenths of one percent, the S&P 500 dropped about nine-tenths, and the tech-heavy Nasdaq finished down nearly 1.7 percent. The declines come ahead of Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell's speech Friday in Jackson Hole at the central bank's annual economic symposium there. He is expected to assure the markets that the Fed will cut interest rates in September. Traders see a 75 percent chance of a 25 basis point reduction then and just a 25 percent chance of a 50 basis point cut, according to CME's FedWatch tool. Stocks on the move included Zoom Video Communications, which jumped 13 percent after raising its annual revenue forecast. And Urban Outfitters plunged 9.6 percent after the apparel retailer posted quarterly same-store sales growth that missed forecasts. A survey revealed that business activity in the Eurozone demonstrated unexpected resilience during this month. However, there are indications that this improvement might be short-lived, as the boost was partly attributed to a significant increase in French services activity related to the Olympic Games. Eurozone business activity showed surprising strength in August despite firms raising prices. That's according to the preliminary Purchasing Managers Index data released on Thursday. The results could weaken expectations that the European Central Bank will make two additional rate cuts this year. The Eurozone's preliminary PMI bounced to a forecast beating 51.2 from July's 50.2, moving it further from 50, the mark which separates contraction from growth. However, the upswing may be temporary. That's as the sunnier readings were driven by a surge in the French service sector due to the Olympics, which offset ongoing weakness in manufacturing. And in Germany, Europe's largest economy, business contracted for a second consecutive month and by more than expected. Even so, the reading beat even the most optimistic of forecasts. In Britain, outside the European Union, readings were also uplifting. Business activity accelerated and cost pressures eased to their weakest in more than three years, signalling steady growth momentum going on in the second half of 2024. And that marks the end of the final bulletin of the Nightly Business Report for this week. We'll see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the business globe. Until then, I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.